13 of the worst restaurant trends in the USA. I'm Chris, this is Yellow Productions. I do travel guides that are fun, informative, and entertaining. And in this video, I'm gonna be talking through some of the negative things I see happening at restaurants in the US, in particular, the death of the great American restaurant, more sneaky fees, just overall negative trends that will make your dining experience in the US less enjoyable, more expensive, maybe you'll have to wait longer to get your food uh, than previously. It's not all bad. I've also got six positive trends that I'm gonna talk through when I'm done with the negative trends. And the first worst trend for restaurants in the USA is the death of the great American restaurant. I decided to write this live stream when I found that my favorite prime rib restaurant in Orange County, Laurie's Carvery, yes, the people who make seasoning salt was closing, was closed. We ate there on the last day. This was one of those classic restaurants in a shopping mall. You can get prime rib, you can get mashed potatoes, you could get some veggies on the side, mac and cheese. You know what's replacing Laurie's? A modern French restaurant, of course. So we have the death of the classic American restaurants, places like um, Cinnabon. Where did Cinnabon go? All the cinnamon rolls are gone from the U.S. They're everywhere in the rest of the world. Cinnabon's doing better outside of the U.S. than it is in the U.S. Uh, Orange Julius. Where did all the Orange Juliuses go? Wiener Schnitzel. Those places are closing up shop. But let me tell you, Wiener Schnitzel makes some really great hot dogs. I find the trend of restaurants is smaller portions, more expensive, and again, just tag that word modern on it, and that makes it all that much better. And, you know, when I went to an Italian restaurant, you know it's modern when you can't get lasagna, but instead you can get squash blossoms. Uh, it's modern if they don't serve ketchup, or if you ask for ketchup, they kind of sneer at you with some disdain while they then go give you the ketchup. And I don't know about you guys, but when I go to an Italian restaurant, I'm not really looking out for squash blossoms. I want a good lasagna. I don't want my lasagna to be $10. I don't want my lasagna to be colored green and have some odd vegetables in it and cost me $30 because it's fancy. Just a good marinara sauce, some noodles, cheese, maybe a little bit of ground beef. That's a good lasagna. Is that a classic American restaurant? Italian food really is about as classic as American gets. Um, and uh, so the second worst trend of restaurants in the U.S. is the death of the family-friendly restaurants. Uh, and by the way, I see in the live chat, there's people saying, you know, we've got tons of Cinnabon in Oregon's. Uh, there's a Cinnabon in the mall next to me, a lot in Texas. Yeah, and definitely the things I see for these food trends, they definitely start on the coasts and then they work their way into the rest of the country. And so California, New York City are definitely the most progressive when it comes to these restaurant trends, but they're definitely they're definitely coming at you across the rest of the US. They probably just start here and I don't I don't like it, um, but that's generally how I view these things. So the death of the family friendly restaurant, in particular buffet restaurants. The pandemic has accelerated this. Places like Hometown Buffet, classic American restaurant on the downslide. Las Vegas buffets, great places to take your family, take your kids. Many of them haven't reopened in Las Vegas in particular. Why? Because the casinos lost money on the buffets. They said, we don't need to run these things that lose money to get people here. The ones we keep open are the family unfriendly back in Al Buffet at Caesars Palace that costs 80 some dollars. Not friendly for your family. Also, I've been to a lot of restaurants lately where we go, we have a two year old, we ask for a high chair, and that's another one, just like the ketchup, they sneer at us and go, no, we don't have any high chairs. What about booster seats? No, we don't have any booster seats either. How's she gonna eat? Well, you, you can bring in the stroller. I'm like, are you guys gonna get high chairs? No. No, we're not gonna get high chairs. I'm like, really? And these aren't like little tiny restaurants. These are like the huge shopping mall where we live in Orange County. Um, big restaurants that have like 100 tables, but yet no high chairs for kids. Um, also, celebrity chef restaurants, another one, not family friendly because they get really expensive. Um, and uh, at that same plaza where we saw Laurie's at South Coast Plaza, some celebrity chef, rest a celebrity chef food hall opened there. It was just more expensive than a food court. It didn't taste any better. It cost more. And I don't know, why is it that we only praise chefs that come up with interesting and unique concepts, something we've never seen before, yet we don't praise chefs that just make 
a really good mac and cheese. I like. I don't think you can be a really great mac and cheese chef and be famous, but I think you should be able to. And what, what about the kids' menus? I feel like kids' menus are on the decline. When we traveled to Vancouver, Canada recently, we found every restaurant we went to gave us a kids' menu, gave us crayons, gave things for the traveling princess to color. That seems to be another dying art in the U.S., the notion of the kids' menus, the crayons. And yes, I feel like uh, the restaurants use the, the pandemic as an excuse to get away from those. So we don't provide the crayons. So there's a pandemic going on. I'm like, you didn't even reuse the crayons. They were just... It's like the kid got the crayons and then and then off they go. But, you know, on that notion of creative food, all these creative food restaurants are worst if you've got kids because kids generally don't like creative things. They prefer simple and consistent. They want their grilled cheese, their uh, sandwich, their chicken nuggets, and things like that. Um, and uh, a point, uh, my dad, Electric Rick, on the live stream says that green lasagna might be okay for St. Patrick's uh, Day, for sure. Uh, Brandon says he hasn't been to a buffet in three to four years because all the good ones are gone. I feel like hometown buffet is gone, Sizzler's gone, like, uh, I guess there's Golden Corral, um, but even all the Vegas ones, like the Rio, the Rio, the, like, it started the buffet trend in Las Vegas. I don't, I don't think the Rio's coming back. It just, it just looks sad. Um, and Jeff says, I had Shoney's self-serve brunch in Tennessee a few weeks ago. For sure, the places you still find these classic American restaurants are the heart of the U.S. Cracker Barrel, you know, Cracker Barrel. I want there to be more Cracker Barrels, more of those just classic down-home restaurants. I actually like to see Cracker Barrel expanding, but, you know, for some reason, Cracker Barrel doesn't make it into the heart of a lot of big American cities. It's just in the small towns, in the suburbs. And why, why is that? Because the third trend uh, is that, you know, a lot of restaurants, salad now costs more than meat. There's been this whole trend of sa like expensive salad restaurants sweeping the nation. Sweet green, tender greens, chopped. There's a bunch more. Those are three to name a few. Uh, if you walk along New York City's Upper East Side, you can't go like a block without finding one of these expensive salad restaurants. And when I say that the salad costs more than meat, it, like it costs more than a burger. Like a, a Caesar salad at Sweet Green starts at $9.95. I mean, I I remember when salads used to just be a couple bucks and now they are $10. And and how did how, how did they do this? Well, you know, these places have made salads not just a bowl of food, but really a lifestyle brand. That's where restaurants are going in the US, not just a place to serve you food, but to be a part of your lifestyle. What kind of lifestyle? Of course, a healthy selfie Instagrammer lifestyle. Um, and so really just looking at salad as a component of that lifestyle rather than just mere bowls of lettuce and vegetables. And on the buffet thing, you know, I, I really liked this chain called um, soup plantation, it's known as sweet tomatoes, various places. So all you can eat soup and salad place. I thought pretty healthy. Unfortunately, the pandemic put them out of business. So I don't know where I can go for my unlimited soup and salad. Actually, I do. I can still go to Olive Garden for that. I'm glad they haven't gone away. And you might say, Chris, but Olive Garden's Italian food isn't all that great. Look, their Italian food isn't all that great. But I dare you to find a better deal than the Olive Garden unlimited soup, salad, and breadsticks, particularly now on the Las Vegas Strip. So that is one uh, promising highlight. Uh, YouTube Experiment says Sweet Green is more than $10 here in New York. Thanks for the data point, uh, YouTube Experiment. I pulled that uh, 995 number um, just the other day when I went online and looked at their menu to be current, uh, but that was of their like their cheapest option. Yeah, their like other salads are, you know, thirteen, fifteen dollars, uh, which is really expensive. Uh, Tracy Conroy points out Fuddruckers and Red Robin gone. It is so sad, right? It really is sad. Um, and uh, Egg says I'd rather eat ten dollar lettuce than a thousand dollar gold leaf steak. I mean, I'd, you know, if you just gave them both to me, I'd rather have the thousand uh, dollar steak. Uh, Susie says she loves Cracker Barrel. They're all over the set. I love Cracker Barrel too. And there aren't many close to us, but there uh, are some in Vegas. There's some on the drive to Vegas uh, along the 15. Uh, and we always stop there when we get a chance as we're going by. Uh, I see Laurel uh, is also one who loved soup plantations. Uh, so awesome. I'm glad it isn't just me. Um, 
And uh, yes, indeed, Randy also says, rest in peace, Sue Plantation. Rest in peace, Sue Plantation. I agree. Um, and Tamala agrees uh, that Olive Garden does make a great salad. Yeah, I think there can be like great salads that don't have to be that expensive. Uh, there's a restaurant uh, in San Diego that I really like called Pizza Nova. They've got a few locations in San Diego. You can get like a pizza and salad, like 13 bucks. Salad's got, you know, in addition to lettuce, like cranberries and walnuts, apples, just a super tasty thing. But it's like, I get that in and my pizza, and for the same price that I would just get only the salad at one of these trendy uh, salad restaurants. The fourth worst trend for restaurants in the US are restaurants that serve food that is free of everything. I don't, besides costs, they cost a lot of money, but these are restaurants where their advertising isn't to tell you what the food, the, like the positive attributes of the food are, but more about what the food doesn't have in it. Like it's organic or it's eco-friendly or it's vegan or it's gluten-free. Um, and all these buzzwords just add to the cost. Why is this? Um, because the restaurant industry has done research that younger generations are willing to pay more for healthy meals tied specifically to these buzzwords, GMO-free, all-natural, organic. Uh, I went to a cookie place the other day uh, in Newport Beach, California, kind of a hoity-toity neighborhood, and this cookie place, when I asked, hey, I've never been here before, can you tell me about the cookies? And the girl behind the counter proceeds to tell me about all of, again, all the things that they don't have in them. Like this one's uh, dairy free, this one doesn't have nuts, uh, this one's gluten free. And of course I'm just like, what's the, what's the tastiest cookie? And of course they're all $6. And I just walked out going like, you didn't convince me that any of your cookies taste good. You just told me what they didn't have in them. And so I, I did not buy one of their $6 cookies. Um, What's Chris drinking today? Chris is thirsty. Today I am drinking uh, teas, tea, organic, organic right there. Cost me more money probably because that because I bought a Whole Foods lemongrass green tea. Hmm. Lemongrass, a popular ingredient in food in Thailand, and it really does have a nice, um, refreshing taste for sure. I did not buy it because it said uh, that, but it says a good labeling, fresh and bright. I think that's a good description for it. Uh, you know, but I think pretty soon, if we continue down this trend of everything free of stuff, we are gonna be eating rocks. That's what I think we're gonna do. This is the, um, like, this is the epitome of where we're gonna get to, where was, this was actually OC Girl and I, on a couple of trips ago to Japan, we went to a restaurant where we grilled our meat on these super hot rocks. They brought these rocks that were in the oven to the table and then you put your meat on the rock to grill. Pretty neat, but didn't eat the rock because rocks aren't all that tasty. Uh, the fifth worst trend of restaurants in the USA apparently is that bowls are better than plates. If you haven't heard this, it's apparently true where if you put food in a bowl, that, that's what people want. People no longer want their food on plates. They want it in a bowl. They want it all together, and they don't want it to be separate like you could do on a plate. Uh, po poke, for example, right here. You know, if you get poke as like a plate lunch in Hawaii, it typically comes some poke and some rice on the side, like a couple scoops of rice and then the poke. And you know what? In my mind, that's actually a lot better than the rice on the bottom and the cold fish on the top because if you don't eat it right away, or even if you do, the rice is making the fish warmer and the fish is making the rice colder and it would just be better if they weren't actually in the same thing. But it's not just poke bowls, it's acai bowls, uh, it's burrito bowls, it's power bowls, it's Buddha bowls. You know, like you give it a name like that and then people are like, I am, in. how much is the Buddha bowl? $15, I will pay it. Now, I actually, Poke, I actually do, I, I like poke bowl restaurants. I just, I actually prefer the poke bowl restaurants that would give me my uh, salad on the side. Um, and Kathy asks, uh, is poke always raw fish? Uh, it's, it's generally raw fish, but I mean, generally these places, if you don't like raw fish, will do like a cooked shrimp perhaps. Uh, I've also seen uh, tofu as an add-in instead of raw fish. So you can get poke without raw fish. Um, 
And uh, Scott says, I just had a poke bowl for lunch today. It was quite tasty. Poke bowls are taking the U.S. by storm, um, but they're not really Hawaiian because you don't find them quite like this in Hawaii. Uh, Vancouver Dave says, bowls are best for burritos. You can mix everything together. I think Chipotle was like the um, originator of the burrito bowl. Uh, and Laurel says, I love the poke um, from Foodland in Hawaii. I agree, the poke at Foodland in Hawaii is super good. Uh, Don says, bowls are just another way to charge more money for the same thing. I agree, you can charge like five more bucks when you just put all the stuff in a bowl. But uh, I will tell you, speaking of like uh, Japanese food, how they like Japanese food, uh, you know, in Japan, they like it like this. You go to a Japanese restaurant and it's, it's generally not in a bowl. I mean, there are Japanese rice bowls, but Generally, you get your food like this, where everything is separate on an individual plate, so you can taste and appreciate that individual thing by itself. And if you want to mix together, more power to you, but you can kind of control how that all goes. Uh, and Vic says Yoshinoya has the best bowl. Yoshinoya does have good bowls, but it's really plain. It's like rice, uh, some onions, some meat, and some sauce. It's not like 80,000 ingredients on top of it. Um, Rhonda says, I know many people don't like Chipotle, but I love it. I like Chipotle too, uh, and it's interesting since I grew up in San Diego, but actually I find that Chipotle's in San Diego are pretty good, and actually I like them a lot better than Chipotle's in the middle of the country, because I find the, because they do everything fresh at Chipotle, I find that the spices and things like that just taste, in my mind, a lot more Mexican. Um, in places close to the border, rather than places far away from the border. Of course, it's funny, since Chipotle started in Denver, not all that near the border, but um, it's pretty tasty. Uh, Yasmin says, we have Payway, and I try not to go there. All right, we're gonna be, we're gonna be talking about uh, some Asian trends coming up here in a second, so hold that thought. The sixth worst trend for restaurants in the U.S. are that there are way too many fried chicken sandwich spots. Apparently, if you haven't heard, the fried chicken sandwich restaurant is like the thing to open. If you have no idea what restaurant you're gonna open, you've got a space, somebody's like, hey, we should open a restaurant. What do you open? If you don't open a Poke Bowl restaurant, then in the US you open a fried chicken sandwich restaurant. In particular, you open a Nashville hot fried chicken restaurant. And then on your menu, you offer like things that are so spicy that uh, nobody on earth can eat them. One such particular chain is called Dave's Hot Chicken. They seem to be like opening everywhere like mushrooms. And if you order their spiciest chicken sandwich, they actually make you sign a waiver to say that if you, if you don't like it, they won't give you your money back. That's how spicy it is. I feel like these restaurants are riding on the success of Popeyes. Um, Popeyes Louisiana Kitchen made a really good chicken sandwich uh, that I think rivals even most of these chains, um, but they sold it for four bucks. And so these places specialize in the Nashville hot chicken sandwich. So they're like, you know what? We're not gonna sell that $4 Nashville chicken sandwich. We're gonna, we're gonna sell the $12 Nashville hot chicken sandwich. Um, but in my mind, they, they just all kind of taste the same. Um, and it's also kind of sad because I, I see a lot of them replacing former Kentucky Fried Chickens. Like it was a place that served fried chicken and they had fryers and so I guess it was easy for just a place to move in that only sells uh, fried chicken sandwiches. Um, Emmett Brown says, uh, word fried chicken sandwich is uh, like the bacon trend of a few years. It is, it is everywhere. Um, and uh, Points Traveler says, come try Nashville hot chicken. I like, I like Nashville hot chicken, actually, um, but I don't know that all these places actually do it really good. Rana says, I've ate there in San Diego. There is a Dave's hot chicken in San Diego. Alex really likes Raising Cane's. Um, you know, and I'll tell you, I like Raising Cane's just because it is a, it's a classic place. What do you get? You get chicken tenders, you get fries. It's not too expensive, it's not too foofy. I feel like they don't think all that much about themselves. Gabriel says, what about ramen restaurants? There are a lot of ramen restaurants opening across the U.S. That is definitely another trend, um, and they're not—they're not all that great. You know, I like really good Japanese ramen, but I feel like when they Americanize it too much, then it's like, oh, this—this this isn't ramen anymore. This is—this is definitely something else. Um, 
Barry says, I like when you have numbers instead of your fingers. I, I have numbers, but you know, the problem if I put up the numbers up here, where do I put up the numbers? Numbers, numbers, numbers. Like I can put up the numbers up here. One, two, three, four. Hey, you want the numbers to go up here? Okay, there we go, six. You'll get the number up on the picture too. Okay, so we're on number six. All right, let's go on to number seven. All right, the seventh worst trend for restaurants across the US is outrageously priced coffee. Apparently, I don't know, there must have been some memo that went out across coffee shops that says you can't sell coffee for like a dollar or two anymore. If you're a new coffee shop opening up, coffee has to be at least $5, preferably $7. A $7 cup of coffee, that's what's gonna get the most people to buy it. And why is it that in Italy, really good coffee is only like two euros and it's better than the coffee from these places that are like seven bucks. And I feel like the trend of these outrageously priced coffee shops is they have, they, they can't just be like a normal looking coffee shop. They definitely have to be Instagram worthy. So they have to look cool inside. And because they get a whole bunch of square footage, they sell like way more stuff than actual coffee. Then they're selling uh, everything like to make coffee, which I, I don't know about you, but I find it bizarre for a coffee shop that sells coffee to then sell a bunch of products for you to buy to make coffee at home instead of buying the coffee at their coffee shop. I really, I really just don't understand. And it's not like these products that these coffee shops sell are like the same ones that they use in the coffee shop to make the coffee. They're like other things. And of course, you know, I'm big on Japanese products. They'll sell you like the Japanese thing to make the coffee because we all want to like do like a pour over and a slow drip and, you know, have a, you know, if you're a guy, have like a handlebar mustache that you like curl and wax up at the end. Those are the people that need to work at these coffee shops. The guys all have to have the mustache with the waxy thing and they got to wear like a apron that looks like it's old and leather. Uh, related to the price, Richard McCarley says it's all Starbucks fault. They've brainwashed everyone. Uh, Fat Nuts says more expensive equals more, but I think people do that. They go into the coffee restaurant and find the most expensive one and say, I'm gonna order that one. Remy says, I get my coffee at the cafe in a local supermarket, $1.60. Uh, I love it. Um, good plan. Um, Basic to Bungie says, I don't see the price going down, so it's probably a trend that's gonna stay. It is uh, definitely unfortunate, I will say. Uh, Alex says, latte should be no more than four to 4.50. Uh, Booba says, what happened to the film uh, strip fonted numbers? Uh, they'll, they'll be back, they'll be back. I, uh, yep, in this studio, I have a new brain for my live stream so that I don't have to move my laptop between rooms and I have not installed the film strip font on this computer. So that's why we get this. And I just, it upgraded to Windows 11 too. So I've just, I spent a little bit of time before this getting it all, getting it all, getting it all working on Windows 11. All right. The eighth worst trend for restaurants in the US is that there are too many fusion restaurants. Now, earlier I mentioned the death of the great American restaurant is because of modern restaurants. I feel like it's also fusion restaurants. Um, fusion restaurants to me are like too confusing. They don't really make it better. It's food that's just like, yeah, I guess, I guess it's different. I guess it's some, you know, bizarre crab foam with little sprigs of who knows that they put on it. Um, I don't know. I find fusion restaurants sound cool and they spent a lot of money and time in a marketing firm to like write their menu options and descriptions about where all the places come from with all these great adjectives, but it, it rarely, I find fusion restaurants rarely taste good. Now, um, related to fusion restaurants, and it's not fusion, it's different, um, but when we heard uh, Payway mentioned earlier, another big trend for restaurants in the US I frankly don't like is the trend of pan Asian restaurants. What is a pan Asian restaurant? Not to be confused with Asian fusion. Pan Asian is about restaurants that serve not just one type of Asian cuisine, but in fact, multiple types of Asian cuisine. And when I went on a, preparing for this video, I went on, you know, I went on the Google, as we all know, and uh, looked at restaurant industry trends that the restaurant industry talks about. One of the things they talk about is that a popular type of restaurant to open is the Pan-Asian restaurant. 
For example, a restaurant that serves Thai food and sushi. These two things do not go together, I would say. Uh, and so I actually, like I avoid these places because neither are good, right? If you serve Thai food or you serve sushi, only one of those is good, both of them are not good. Um, and I mean, I guess it's a place where a lot of people could go and get something that maybe they're happy with, but again, none of, none of them great. Um, Tamala asks if I like the food court at Resorts World. I did in fact like the food court at Resorts World. Um, I ate at the uh, hawker stall for noodles. That's uh, the goggle man one. I ate at the dumpling stall. Um, those are the two places I ate at. I liked those quite a bit. I did not eat at all the stalls. Some people say they don't like them. Uh, well, the week I was there, the Singaporean chicken rice place was closed, as was the like Singaporean Indian restaurant. I do want to try both those, but the ones I had uh, were pretty tasty. Um, Alex says, can I recommend an Asian dish for someone who doesn't like sushi? I, that's like That category is so broad of Asian dishes. Um, but if you're looking for Japanese food and you don't like uh, sushi, uh, katsu that I showed earlier, breaded fried pork cutlet rice, pretty good. Um, not that many people that hate katsu. Um, Artie says, I might have missed it, but the worst trends uh, is asking for tips on takeout and those same credit card machines starting at 22%. And hold that thought, Artie. Uh, we will get there for sure. Um, okay. Actually, you know what? Uh, let's talk about that for the next one. What are we on now? Nine, the ninth worst trend. All sorts of extra fees. Restaurants now, because they lost a lot of money during the pandemic, they're like, how do I get that money back? I need to get the money back. They didn't make when I was closed. People weren't coming here. Um, and these like show up on your bill with things like 2% healthcare fee, 1% energy surcharge fee, 3% credit card fee. How about restaurant? You just raise the fry, you just raise the price and don't add 10% of extra fees onto my bill. Uh, also, I find the annoying um, mandatory service charge and no tip if they don't tell you about it. I don't mind, I, by the, I am all on board for not tipping and increasing the prices. I don't like the, here's the price, by the way, we charge you 18% more. Raise the price, 18%, and then say no tip, and then say no service charge. It's delusional to have these prices that then have some like some percentage modifier later. It's so bizarre. Um, you know, we heard the annoying one about the mandatory tips that start at 22%. We've done online ordering recently where like we couldn't order without leaving a tip. I'm just going to pick up the food. Why do I have to leave a tip? It's another one of those like forced fees. I also don't understand convenience fees for online ordering. Like seems to me like ordering it on a website should cost the restaurant less because they don't have the labor at the restaurant, but then they charge you more because it's more convenient. I'm like, it should save you money. You should want more people to do that, not ch charge them for the privilege of not standing in line. I mean, that's certainly a benefit. Um, but this is also related to worse trends. So in the pandemic, all these restaurants rushed to join Uber Eats and DoorDash and these kind of like aggregator apps where people could order things. And then the restaurant said, well, it's it's getting too expensive for us to be part of those, so we want to establish our own online ordering thing on our own website. Except the customer experience of actually ordering from their website is generally really awful. Like people like Uber Eats because it's easy and you can see where the driver is and you can see when your food is ready and the menu looks good. And then some restaurant sets up their own website and it's like, I can't figure out how to order or set up an account. I don't want to have an account for every restaurant that I order from and a password for every restaurant that I order from and enter my credit card for every restaurant that I order from and then not knowing my food's ready or you order it like on Uber Eats. It's nice because like if you order the food, it'll be ready in 20 minutes. You order from some random restaurant website. It doesn't tell you that long. You, you put the order in, you place it, and then you get an email that says your food will be ready in an hour. I'm like, an hour? In that case, I want my money back. I don't want to wait an hour. Mm. Yeah, and so uh, Marge agrees with me 
Uh, Marge says, thank you. Just raise the prices. Just raise the prices. I agree with you. Let's get rid of all the fees and let's just go ahead and raise the price. Jay Lee says, uh, these all charge restaurants a lot of money. I'm going back to old school and ordering directly with the restaurant. Well, good for you, Jay Lee. And you know, I read things online that talk about how customers like to order directly with the restaurant because they want to avoid the fees of these third parties. And I agree. I just wish the restaurants would find some platform that doesn't charge a bunch of fees. And there are some, actually. There's like one called Toast. If they use the Toast cash register, then Toast doesn't charge them any extra fees for online ordering. And it provides a good experience. Uh, I just think they haven't figured out how to do that. Um, okay. The 10th worst trend for restaurants in the USA 2022 are credit card only for payments. Now, I have to qualify this. I pretty much pay with my credit card for everything. If you've been a frequent um, viewer of Yellow Productions, you know one of the things I talk about about how to travel cheap is using rewards credit cards so that you can get free hotels and free flights. And So I generally pay with everything by credit card. Anyway, so this doesn't really impact me. What I really worry about though with this trend of restaurants that put up a little sign that says we're you know electronic only or credit card only is for all the people who come and visit the U.S. that don't have a credit card and bring a credit card, don't want to use their international credit card because they don't want to incur the international surcharges and instead have money. Like they took money out of the ATM, they changed money at the airport, they changed money back in their country and then they get to this restaurant and they're like, I have money. I would like to buy your food. And they go, nope, you need to have a piece of plastic. You need to have some funny money because we, we won't take your actual money. Um, I just The fact that we can't use actual money anymore, uh, to me, it, I don't know. It, it shouldn't be a thing. Um, money slows things down. But what I like, I, where I've, places I've seen this work well, like in Thailand, in their food courts, uh, they do things where they'll have like a central cashier that you go and give them money, money, and then they give you like a card that then you can use to pay for all of the different uh, vendors in the food court. Um, it's a way that then the vendors don't have to touch money, uh, but yet you can still use your, your money, money, your Thai bot with this person who then gives you the card that you use later. Uh, Points Traveler says, what's money? I know. Um, Remy says, they need to start accepting Dogecoin. Yeah, I'll see that soon. By the way, you know, I see all of these um, Bitcoin ATMs everywhere, like 7-Elevens and gas stations. Who who uses a Bitcoin ATM? Has anybody on this live stream ever used a Bitcoin ATM? If if you have, why? What do you what do you do with uh, a Bitcoin ATM? YouTube Experiment says sometimes I want to pay cash for sure. Um, so places should be able to accept our money. The eleventh worst trend of restaurants in the USA in 2022 are more kiosks to place your order and less people to take your order. If you read restaurant industry publications, they will talk about performing studies where customers prefer to use a kiosk to place their order than placing it with a person. I feel like these study, and they cite numbers like 70% of customers, 80% of customers would rather place their order with a kiosk than with a human being. And I feel like these studies are misguided because they probably asked somebody after just standing in line for 20 minutes at McDonald's with the really slow cashier, and they were like, hey, would you prefer to place your order with the human or a kiosk if there was no line? Like there's some qualifier about why they just had an awful experience and how this could be better. But my experience with kiosks has not been good. Even at McDonald's kiosks, like I go to McDonald's, let's say I want to order an iced tea. I go to the kiosk push the button for iced tea, it gives me a number. Nobody ever gets me my iced tea. Why does nobody ever get me my iced tea? Because it's a McDonald's with a self-serve drink thing and at the cash register, when you place your order, they would just give you the cup. And so my order like, goes to Nowhereville because that would have just been processed by the human being. I would have got my cup right away. Or it gets put into the food queue and I don't get my cup until a whole bunch of other people have got their Big Mac. I just, I just want my drink. Um, you know, so McDonald's really started the kiosk trend. Shake Shack, uh, is rolling this way too. Um, but you know, another issue I've had with, um, and it's not even kiosks. It's like a lot of restaurants now in the U S 
they make they make you order uh, digitally. Like we went to a restaurant the other day called Wealthy. W h e a l t h y. Wealthy. Um, it's kind of like a Chipotle for Chinese food, like stir fry Chinese food, where they've got like all these ingredients. And the first time we went to Wealthy, we ordered from a human being when they first opened, and it was nice. We placed our order in like 30 seconds. Pretty nice. The last time we went to Wealthy, we go in and they're like, are you eating here? And we're like, yes. And they're like, okay, please sit down at your table, scan the QR code on your table and order via your phone. We no longer take your order up here. It probably took me six or seven minutes to place the order from their clunky QR code on their website to type in my credit card number, my name, the expiration date, the CVV code, where before I just, I got to tap my credit card and I got to tell them, I just, I want this that I see on the picture, but now I had to go through all this rigmarole. I mean, almost, almost felt like leaving, frankly, because I'm like, you're gonna, you're gonna make it so hard for me to order food. The other thing I've seen at restaurants are instead of investing money in a kiosk, like an actual like thing that's designed for people to use easily, they take their um, cash register that the employees use and just turn the screen around for you to use. Oh my gosh, cash registers are designed for the employees, not the people. You go to these restaurants and you're like, I don't, I don't know how to use these things. Uh, there's a, a boba tea uh, and dessert shop called Meat Fresh and they did this. And I'm like, oh, this is, this is the worst experience ever to try to order from these things. Um, Tamala Reed uh, says, Noodles and Company has done that. They put up a sign saying app ordering only. It is so annoying. Um, the American Gaming Union says, a couple of my Walmarts have no cashiers and all self-checkout. That is very odd. Yeah, and Justin says, it's a lot harder to customize items too. Yeah, Justin, I had this issue at Wealthy. I wanted a particular noodle and I wanted it spicy, but there's no, there's no like spicy checkbox on the app. So I'm ordering this and then I go up to the guy to be like, can I get this spicy? And he's like, oh yeah, we can put chili flakes in it and this and that. And I'm like, how do you... How do you want me to, there's no box. He's like, ah, well, you told me. So I'll just be on the lookout for the order and I'll do that. And I'm like, couldn't I just told you what I wanted and you took my order? I mean, <laughs> Booba asks about uh, the kiosk uh, ordering system at the famous food street eats as Resort Swirl. Actually, I found their kiosks fairly easy to use, but they did require a lot of, um, like to charge it to my room. It was really, it was really annoying and took a long time. Um, so their kiosks could definitely be um, streamlined quite a bit. And I, it's just one where I'm like, I wish there was the option of you can order at the kiosk or you can order at the person. But yeah, places like Resorts World, there, there's, there's no per, there's no person to order from. Like it's only from the kiosk. Uh, Dylan said Chipotle did the online order thing to me in San Jose. Almost left too. Yeah. Tyler says I hate self checkouts. Uh, Kisun says, I began carrying boiled eggs. Jeez, it saves me time and money. That's, Kisun, that's a great, great plan. Solves you the time. Um, I agree. Um, and uh, Justin says, in all honesty, ordering stuff online, kiosks can be just as much of a headache sometimes. For sure. Um, Remy, so I, Remy makes a great point here. Costco has actually rolled out a pretty good kiosk system at their food courts. I agree. They'd spent some time on that. They spent some energy on that. You've got all the pictures of things. At Costco, you don't customize your pizza or your hot dog. You order it, you push three buttons, it prints it out, and then you go over there and show them your receipt and you pick up your food. They've done it well because they really put some serious thought and time into how they re-engineer their workflows, which is not what most people have done. Um, okay. The 12th worst trend in restaurants. And I saw, I saw somebody put this in the chat, like right at the beginning of the live stream, which is ghost kitchens. Uh, this is a trend taking the U S by storm restaurants that want to open up to get in on the DoorDash Uber eats delivery trend. And they're like, I don't need a storefront. I don't need to be in a place where, you know, like restaurants are, I can open in some random business park and cook food 
and then people can come and pick it up. Well, drivers can come pick it up and bring it to your house. And uh, what's this, this picture up here? This picture is of a ghost kitchen in Orange County, California. Uh, this is what they have on their website if you want to pick up the food from them, like you're going to pick it up. And this picture over here, this is the business park they're in. These are all the different like little things. And this is the picture of the door with that little red sign right there. And you, you pull up your car and then you call that phone number and then they bring your food out from that door. I don't know about you, but I actually, I kind of like, kind of like to see where they're cooking my food. I kind of like to know where it comes from, not just to be like, yeah, send me that food from anywhere, you know? I mean, I don't feel like I need to be like the health inspector or things like that, but just this sort of trend, I I question, and I, you know what? I'm not questioning this place. They might have really great health standards and great kitchen back there. I've never been there. Um, but uh, the other trend about ghost kitchens, yeah, Tamala points this out, uh, is that there will be like a bunch of them that open up in the same place. So yeah, this address for this ghost kitchen, they like they don't just sell one thing. They're like 10 different restaurants on Yelp or DoorDash. You know, one gets bad reviews. They close that one, open another one. And so it's kind of really hard to figure out who's making this food and what business in it because they just open uh, like a different name, different business, different picture, different menu, same people, you know, same ownership, same bad food, but you'd never know and the bad ratings would go away because they open up something else. Uh, Emmett says, Ghost Kitchen equals rat burgers. I, I think so. Um, Brandon says, I'd love to see behind the scenes of Ghost Kitchens. Uh, probably uh, the bad ones, uh, not so much. Uh, Antone says, uh, you can't see most kitchens anyway. I don't know, I feel like the open kitchen is actually a pretty big uh, concept now. One of the things I like about Cheesecake Factory, Din Tai Fung, and by the way, I get that at Din Tai Fung, I only see a portion of their kitchen, but the fact that they let me see one portion of it and it's pretty nice, makes me think the rest of it is. Whether it is, I don't really know, but the fact they can make one look pretty good probably leads me to believe they can make the rest of them look pretty good. <laughs> yeah, uh, William says, you go to a ghost kitchen like this, you can get fried chicken and an oil change. That's what this place looks like. It looks like you should drive in there and get an oil change for sure. The 13th worst trend, uh, by the way, this is the last worst trend, but I've got six good trends for restaurants in 2022, so, so hang on after this one. Um, 13th worst trend is lack of of staff. This is plaguing restaurants across the country. They can't hire enough people to to work there. And the way this has impacted a lot of restaurants is restaurants just can't hire people to to open for seating inside. A number of restaurants we regularly eat at are still delivery only, not because they're, I mean, they may be super concerned about the pandemic going on, but when I ask them like, hey, why are you still takeout only? They're like, oh, we just can't, we can't hire people um, to be wait staff. So we're, we're just takeout only because that's all, all that we can do. Um, or, you know, the other way we see it, a lot of restaurants, shorter hours, less days, shorter menus because they don't have enough cooks to make all the food uh, that they made before. And I think this is going to accelerate automation. Um, the picture that we see here, this is a automated Jamba Juice that opened at a Walmart. It's a Jamba Juice kiosk where you can get your smoothie uh, made by this robot so they don't, they don't need to hire any people because you can get it like that. Um, the other thing related to not having enough people uh, that I'm seeing at restaurants in the U.S. is curbside pickup at a lot of restaurants is going away. Um, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, you could go to a restaurant, they'd have a thing on a curb, like a number, you park at stall one, you call them and you say, like, hey, I'm here, can you bring my food to me? And that, like more and more restaurants are doing away with curbside pickup because sending someone out to go all the way to the car it takes them too much time. It takes that person away from serving other customers, it takes them away from answering the phone, it takes them away from cooking the food. Um, what I'm seeing in place of curbside pickup are big shelves um, where restaurants can put the takeout orders because they've been getting so many takeout orders, they've had no places to put them. And actually at uh, El Pollo Loco, which is a big uh, Mexican rotisserie chicken chain, They've completely gotten rid of their salsa bar at many of their locations and replaced the salsa bar with just a big like four or five tier shelf 
that if you place your order over the phone or online, assuming you paid for it before, then when they're done, they just place the order on the shelf. Um, Points Traveler says, uh, we're turning into an idiocracy real quick. Uh, great movie for sure. Does anybody have, what is it, Br Bondo, Brondo? The drink that's in uh, Idiocracy. <clears throat> um, Rhonda says, really, I still see curbside pickup at Porto's or Chili's. And it's still some places for sure, but I see it at less and less places. Uh, the big places probably still doing it, but the smaller places are um, doing less of it. Uh, whereas my map uh, gives a data point on the online order, Pyology required you to order online, no staff to even take your order. It's crazy. Like, what about people that don't have smartphones, don't have data plans, all these sorts of things? Like, how do they order? And I, I feel like actually being that person at these places, just to, I don't, I mean, I have a smartphone, but I feel, it's just in my pocket. You need to order online. Uh, I didn't bring my phone. Can, can you take my, like, I feel like they can. They just don't want to. So, um, Okay, let's talk about uh, some of the positive trends now in restaurants in the U.S. So the first positive trend, just so you know that Chris, Chris isn't complaining about everything all the time, although this is part of my like worst series, this is part of my like complaints, this is Chris's rant series. Uh, but positive trends, great things uh, I do see in restaurants. Number one, we have talked about a lot about digital and contactless ordering. When it works, order ahead digital is great. I don't want to do it at the restaurant. I want to do it before I get there. Um, and I do this for lunch all the time now. Like if I go uh, to my favorite fish taco place or I go to Shake Shack, I order from my app and I order it online. And then when I get there, it's done. It's great not to have to stand in line. It's great not to have to wait for my food to be cooked. But if I'm there, I still want to place the order with the person because that's just, I might be around the corner. And we, oh, Seagram and I talk about this a lot where we're like, you know, we're three minutes from a place and we're like, oh, we should order online. I'm like, but we're, th we're three minutes from there. We should just go, we should go there and order. And then, and then we get in that situation. Well, you had to order online anyway. Uh, but then it takes 60 minutes. Oh, well, I wouldn't have eaten there. Luckily, we went to a restaurant the other day um, where we were having that conversation. Let's order it online. Let's not. And we got there and we're like, oh, there's a line of 30 people. <laughs> I'm glad we didn't order it online because if the line is that long, then the wait for getting the food for online order would have been just as long. Um, the second positive trend, I really like this one, uh, is enhanced loyalty programs and the loyalty programs going digital. Big trend of specifically drink places in the US have been these um, like frequent customer cards where every time you get like a boba tea, they give you a punch and then you know you punch it 10 times and you get a free one. A lot of restaurants, because they're using a lot of these digital platforms, the iPad, Toast, things like that, uh, it's just connected to your credit card. There's a great boba tea shop where we live where they just literally is connected to the credit card. Every 10 drinks you buy on the same credit card, you you get like the 11th drink free. And I'm like, what? why doesn't everybody do this? They don't need my name. They don't need my phone number. This just tracks it on that same credit card. And it's it's the deal where like, you order the drink and maybe it was six dollars and then they swipe the credit card and they're like, oh, you got a free drink. Would you like to use it for this? I would. Thank you. So that's uh, a pretty uh, nice feature. Um, you know, I also see loyalty programs going on to like apps that you can scan. I don't like that as much because now I got to like log into a gazillion apps. I got a gazillion QR codes. I really like it when they can make it um, like perfectly seamless. The third good trend for restaurants in the U.S. in 2022 are smaller menus. I talked about this as a negative thing, but I can see it actually as a positive thing, not in restaurants that have big menus making them smaller, but a lot of new restaurants just focusing on limited menus. Restaurants have realized that the American consumer isn't looking for a menu that's like 8,000 pages long. I love Cheesecake Factory. I love the 8,000 menu items they have on there. Um, but uh, I'm also good with places that just really focus on something. And I find when they focus, they just do a lot better. For example, uh, this restaurant here, this is a gyuton restaurant, uh, kautong, gyuton, uh, Japanese charcoal style. Um, they have like six items on the menu. All of them have gyuton. Uh, just how do you want it? Do you want your gyuton grilled? Do you want your gyuton and curry? Do you want small gyuton? Do you want the large gyuton? You want like 
eight pieces? Do you want like 12 pieces? Do you want the gouton soup? And it, and it, and that's it. No, no mac, no mac and cheese over there. It's in, of course, a food court that next to it is a place that just sells ramen. And the next to that is a place that just sells udon. And next to that is a place that just sells beer. Next to that is a place that just sells green tea, ice cream. Um, but I feel like that's a positive trend, seeing restaurants focus on just a small amount of things. Um, the fourth interesting trend, uh, and this is it's kind of like ghost kitchens, but not as bad in my mind because it's a pop-up restaurant in a place. We're seeing a lot of pop-up restaurants within restaurants. A uh, ramen restaurant that we like to go to had a pop-up inside. What does that mean? I mean, it they sell something different in here called Karage Mania, which is Japanese fried chicken. And they had some really interesting um, Japanese fried chicken dishes for a limited time in there that they wouldn't have had otherwise, I thought were pretty good. So kind of neat to be able to try these things. Um, also, uh, like in, a, in San Clemente, California, there's a place that sells Detroit pizza in a brewery. It was a brewery and they're like, ah, what can we do with extra space? How can we get people to sell pizza? And so they knew somebody that makes Detroit pizza. Now they make the Detroit pizza inside the brewery. And so it's instead of like the brewery selling the pizza, now it's this other business within the brewery selling the pizza. The fifth best trend for restaurants in the US is food halls. And sometimes I talk neg negatively about food halls because what's a food hall? A food hall is a more expensive food court, right? We've had food courts forever, um, but food halls generally have less chain restaurants and they open in places that maybe aren't just shopping malls. Actually, uh, food halls have been opening in a lot of large square footage areas that maybe used to be department stores or used to be supermarkets, like big you know, anchor tenants that have just gone under. Um, and uh, actually I found a, like a real estate firm report that was doing some analysis on this. And they said, um, since 2016 in the US, 223 food halls have opened. And currently there's 165 in development because there's so much available square footage of big stores that have closed. And then um, shopping centers or malls or landowners actually are keen to rent to a food hall because they see it as a less volatile tenant because now there's like 10 food places, like the whole food hall is unlikely to go under. Maybe these little places will go under, but the whole food hall won't. Uh, Tam Tamala says uh, food halls are amazing. I agree, I like, I like the food hall trend. Uh, and in fact, I think in Orange County, um, there's like three or four food halls that have opened in just the last uh, two years. Um, which is cool. All right, the last good trend for restaurants in the US is outdoor dining for the win. The pandemic really has made people understand that outdoor dining is a thing. People like want to sit outside. Other countries, other cities have known this for a long time. Italy, they've known this for a long time. France, they've known this for a long time. You go to Rome, restaurants often have more outdoor seating than indoor seating. You go to Paris, People want to sit at the street side cafe and they, they don't want to sit inside. Like the street side cafe is where it's at in Paris. Um, but most American restaurants before the pandemic really viewed their outdoor seating as an afterthought. Something that's just like it's there. It gives them a few more seats. But I didn't used to like to sit outside. Even a place like Cheesecake Factory, you sit outside and you're like, your service is definitely gonna be slower. It's gonna be hard to flag down a server because they just, I don't know, they put the ones that aren't very good out here. It takes them a long time to get here. They don't see me. Uh, but now restaurants are seeing their outdoor areas, not as second areas, but as the primary area, um, as they should be. And I think that's fantastic. And a lot of cities in the US are going through this. Um, a lot of restaurants opened up places in sidewalks, parks, public areas. Some cities have said, ah, we gotta do away with all of that, um, but others are trying to figure out how they can use that public space in a way to benefit the restaurants, to benefit people who wanna sit outside. Uh, and I think, uh, frankly, that is a fantastic trend. Uh, Tanner says, outdoor dining is only good when the weather is good. You know, you think that, uh, Tanner, but in say like uh, Japan, you know, that's like there's these um, street side, like in, in a few, this is like Fukuoka, for example, they have these like street side restaurants that like six people can sit at like a, like a food cart outside. 
<coughs> and then they got plastic that goes over it so you can sit there in the rain. They've got heaters. Uh, and so you can definitely make outdoor seating nice when the weather isn't great too. Uh, Emmett points out uh, that there's too many transients for me to enjoy outdoor eating. I can see that Emmett. My counterpoint to that is uh, I believe we could set up outdoor restaurants that aren't on the sidewalk. Like the transients get to the sidewalk, but um, if you set up the outdoor eating in a place that isn't the public street, that you can have security that keeps the transients out, like there can be nice outdoor eating things. But yes, um, if it's just uh, full of the um, urban campers, then uh, people don't enjoy that. Rachel says, uh, I've always preferred outdoor seating. I like all weather. That is uh, fantastic. Uh, Jeff Jones asks if I ever eat at home. I eat breakfast at home nearly every day um, and dinner at home sometimes. I generally eat lunch. I eat lunch out all the time, like generally all the time. You know, 95% of the time I eat lunch out. I cook a mean barbecue steak. I will tell you, barbecue, like on the grill, something like that. Fellow explorers, it is now Q&A time. If you've got a question, I've got an answer. All right, fellow explorers, if you asked a question and I didn't answer it before, uh, hit me up again, put a question mark about it, or if you didn't, now is your time to ask some questions. As usual, on every live stream, I'll be giving away a Yellow Productions crew shirt in just a little bit, so stay tuned for that. Um, Remy says, what about the bees? Uh, bees are annoying, but I don't know. There's a lot of places that don't have bees, so it isn't a big deal. Uh, Vancouver Dave points out rooftop outside is the best. Rooftop dining is pretty cool for sure. Um, TV Freebie says outdoor seating is all about the location. It does have to be in a good location. You, know, you don't want to be in a really sucky location bothered by the transients and, you know, bees or whatever. Eddie asks if I like red mango. Uh, most of them have gone into business here, but it was like pink berry, red mango. I liked it when they were around, um, but they're sort of gone right now. Uh, Point Traveler asks, I'm going to the Super Bowl, Yellow Productions, getting a box. Yeah, Super Bowl's in Los Angeles. I will not be going to the Super Bowl. I was looking to see if they had like an outdoor festival as part of it. They do have a Super Bowl festival. It's at the Los Angeles Convention Center. I didn't really want to go pack it inside the convention center with a bunch of people, so uh, I won't be going to that either. Dave says, what's the most expensive buffet in Vegas? It's the Bacchanal Buffet at Caesars Palace, currently 80 some dollars per person. The Sterling Buffet at Bally's, which, uh, wait, was, that, was that one of the ones going through a name? The Harris goes through the name change. The Sterling Buffet at Bally's was the most expensive, 100 some dollars a person. Uh, it has not reopened since the pandemic. Um, Ooh, Dr. Quinn, medicine woman. Do we talk paper straws? One of the worst trends. I hate paper straws. I should have added that as one of the trends. At uh, Vegas casinos, like paper straws are everywhere. I, in my car now, carry plastic straws <laughs> so that if I'm at a place, it's a paper straw, I can replace it with a plastic straw. I hate them. Um, When's my next uh, Vegas trip? Uh, well, I just got back in, went to Vegas in December. I'm still working through all of our Vegas footage, so I'm uh, gonna be probably a while before I get back to Vegas again, because I gotta get through all that stuff. Our next trip is up to uh, California Central Valley. Uh, many of you uh, answered my question about where should I go to see the Alban Blossoms. Thank you for that. Um, so that's the next thing. We're gonna do a road trip through California Central Valley to see the almond blossoms. Emmett says, what's the best new food you've eaten lately? New food, huh? Um, I think I talked about this in my best discovery video the other day, uh, but it's, uh, oh, what's it called? Uovo, U-O-V-O. -O. I mean, it's not new food, but it's a pasta restaurant in LA that like flies in their pasta from, uh, flies in the pasta and the ingredients from Italy, flies in the cheese from Italy, like every day, they say. Uh, it's pretty good. Um, Cheeto says, uh, where's the traveling princess? She is getting her learn, learning, learning on at the shul. That's what they call it, I think. Uh, what's a dish from your travels you know you won't get the chance to ever eat again, but desperately wish that you could eat again? One of the things that OC Girl and I talk about fondly is in Japan, in Hokkaido, the northern island, they have this dish called soup curry. I like curry, but it's soupy. It's got vegetables, meat, things in it. Really unique dish that you can really only find in Hokkaido. I think we know we're not going to have that again until we go back to Hokkaido to eat soup curry. Um, 
The question uh, of the week from Jay Lee is, do I think more Vegas Bays, do I think more Vegas buffets will come back? Is this it? I think more will come back, um, but I think it's gonna be a while before more come back. I don't think Caesars is gonna open more. I think we're gonna have to wait uh, till, you know, some new, you know, people take over the Palms or things like that. The Rio is gonna be taken over as a Hyatt. So I think some of these new places may um, bring buffets there as a place to draw people in. Um, Points Traveler uh, says, it looks like Australia is opening up to foreigners. Any plans of going down under? It's fantastic news that Australia is opening up um, for the world. I know there's some people in Australia that are like, we still don't want visitors, uh, but it's great to see the world opening up again. We'd like to go down there. Um, you know, with a with a two-year-old, maybe we'll wait till she's a little hardier, sleeps a little bit better before we put her on the, <clears throat> you know, 14-hour flight to go there. Uh, Fob Deep says, what's your go-to buffet dish? You know, carved meats, if there's like some good prime rib or, you know, if I go to the Bellagio buffet, they've got like beef wellington or things like that. I'm all about that. I'm also all about desserts. I like buffets that have high-end desserts. I will take a dinner plate over to the dessert counter to uh, get that. Yes, it's the time you've been waiting for. It's time for the giveaway. All right, fellow explorers, if you answer my question, I will send you this Yellow Productions Crew shirt if you're the first person to answer it correctly. My question is, uh, there's a restaurant I talked about that closed that made me want to do this live stream, a classic American restaurant. What is the name of that restaurant? Uh, if you answer that question correctly, you will win this shirt shipped to you. Uh, you gotta get you gotta get the full name. It's like a brand and then a name that goes under it. It was the first thing I talked about at the beginning of this live stream. By the way, if you uh, don't get to win one and you want to pick up uh, some Yellow Productions merch, a shirt, things like that, uh, you can pick them up here at the Yellow Productions shop, shop.yellow-productions.com. If you wonder when the next live stream is and you want to join the Yellow Productions mailing list because I send out an email at least a day or two ahead to let you know when it's going to be, what the topic's going to be, uh, head over to update.yellow-productions.com to sign up for the Yellow Productions mailing list. And now we have a winner, winner chicken dinner. All right, we have a winner, and on this new computer, my uh, scroll wheel doesn't work, so I can't get to the thing, but there we go, YouTube experiment, congratulations. Laurie's Carvery at South Coast Plaza closed. They closed our other location at LA Live too, no more Laurie's Carveries, so sad. Um, send me an email to chris at yellow-productions.com. Let me know your address, let me know your size, <coughs> and I will get that headed out to you right there. That's the email address right there. Well, fellow explorers, pleasure chatting with you today, hanging out with you as always. As usual, I won't say goodbye because I'll see you in the next video.